Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zune, and all major podcast providers. So if you can't catch the show live, you can download it or simply use our free podcast player, which is available on our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to connect with us, please post a question on our wall on Facebook or send me a tweet at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Austria's Finest Naturally, authentic pumpkin seeds and pumpkin seed oil from the Steiermark, available at organicuniverse.com. Listeners of The Organic View can receive $1 off their purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. Also, don't forget to check out our contest section on our website to submit your information for our free monthly giveaways. For more information, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com forward slash contests. As we continue our special series called The Neonicotinoid View, which is the only show focused on the impact of neonicotinoids, Tom and I are going to talk about some recent industry news, as well as the current state of commercial beekeeping. So I'd like to welcome my co-host, Colorado beekeeper Tom Theobald. Good afternoon, Tom. Good afternoon, Jen. Let's begin by talking about the current state of the bees here in America. How has this year's honey crop been, and also... What is the current status of the commercial beekeeping industry? There's been so much that has been circulating out there. I get a lot of questions on social media, not to mention emails and comments, that everything appears to be fine, where are these losses occurring, so on and so forth. So considering that this is your profession, could you share with our listeners exactly what's been going on this entire year? Boy, you know, there's no simple answer to that question, June, but let me take a crack at it. Uh, It's a little like real estate. It's location, location, location. Here in Colorado, at least along the northern front range, we've had a fairly good year. Uh, We've had some good honey flows. We've had moisture at the right time. And even though the colonies may have been struggling, A strong honey flow can mask a multitude of ills, and we've had a fairly good year. In other parts of the country, that's not quite the same. I think overall, things really haven't changed. Uh, Commercial beekeepers are are still losing colonies at uh, an excessive rate. We're, We're being told by the corporate interests that the number of colonies is actually Increase, and I'd like to touch on that just a little bit. We've had a problem with um, monitoring the colony numbers over the years with what we call double counting. And because of the way they count the colonies, they count them by virtue of honey production. And if colonies are present in more than one state, they can be counted twice. And that problem has not changed. We're still having that double counting problem. But let's assume that uh, that the figures are accurate and that there has been a small increase in the number of colonies. You need to look behind those statistics to understand what's really going on. Because I deal with the beekeeping community and agriculture, I've put it, I've used an agricultural analogy, and that is, let's say that you are a rancher and you have a small cow calf operation and you have 200 mother cows and a hundred of them die. But the other hundred have calves, and uh, some of those uh, mother cows have more than one calf, and at the end of the year, you wind up with 250 cattle. Well, statistically, it looks like you've gained on things, but if you look at that herd, what you find is that of that 250, 150 of those are on death's door. They're barely alive. They're struggling to survive. And that's that's what we're seeing in the bee world. The beekeepers have changed their focus from honey production because of weak colonies, loss of habitat, a number of things, and they've focused on the production of bees, replacing their numbers because the cash flow for many of these commercial beekeepers has become pollination, and primarily almond pollination in California 
in January, February, and March. So the their resources have been put into increasing the colony numbers, which gives, I think, a, an inflated and unrealistic view of what's going on. If you look at honey production, and Michelle Colopy of the uh, Pollinator Stewardship Council made it very clear a week or two ago when she talked about honey production, and she said there's another measure of how well things are going, and the national honey production is at the lowest level ever recorded since records were kept. So are the bees doing better? No, I don't think so. I think the problems that we've been seeing have continued, in many cases have become worse, and if if there are additional colonies, that does not necessarily reflect a healthy beekeeping industry. I just think that it's very interesting that people think because there has been a honey crop that everything's fine. I think it's disturbing that people think that because maybe some of the hobbyists are having a decent honey flow, that's a representation of all beekeepers. Tom, could you expand upon what the differences are between the hobbyists, what they're experiencing, as well as the commercial beekeepers? Because that's a common question that I'm asked. People don't understand why there's so many issues in commercial beekeeping when they might have a friend, a family member, or a neighbor who's a hobbyist beekeeper. Well, we've we've seen a large increase in the number of hobbyist beekeepers, and, and that's very positively motivated. They want to try to help. They understand that we're losing the bees, and but they're at a, a great disadvantage because they have no context in which to hang their experiences. And let me just give you some numbers. Nationally, the honey production per colony over the years has been in the neighborhood of 70 to 80 pounds per colony. Now, in many parts of the country, the Dakotas, for example, that average production per colony may be much higher than that, 150 or 200 pounds per colony. A commercial beekeeper or a beekeeper who whose livelihood is based upon honey production would need to produce those kinds of crops in order to, for it to make business sense. It's a little different for the hobbyists, and they don't really have anything to compare it to, and they think if they get a gallon or two of honey at the end of the year, they've had a bumper crop. So it's it's trying to compare apples and oranges, and what the hobbyists think is a successful year may be just getting by. Their colonies are just barely making it. A productive colony of honeybees is is capable of producing a large crop of honey, more than a, than a gallon or two. Thanks, Tom. One of our listeners sent in an article that was published on abc.net.au, and the article is titled, Award-Winning Cicero Scientist Calls for Improved Agricultural and Remnant Vegetation Management for Bees. And this was published this was written by Babs McHugh. I think it's quite interesting that you have so many experts out there that are calling for improved environments for the bees. However, what baffles me is that a lot of these folks keep overlooking a critical component here, which is the impact of neonicotinoids. Well, yeah, habitat improvement has been promoted by a lot of people, and on the surface, at least, it makes a lot of sense. If you have an insect, a pollinating insect, that's dependent upon flowers, and there's been a shortage of flowering plants, increasing the number of flowering plants or improving the habitat seems to make a lot of sense. When I was in the corporate world, this is what we would have called a motherhood statement. You could hardly challenge that. I mean, how could you challenge habitat improvement? But, again, you need to look beneath the surface. And the reality is that, in, a, in the United States at least, much of the available habitat appears to be heavily poisoned by these systemic pesticides at a toxic rate, which is quite literally billions of times what we saw with DDT. So 
if you have a, a habitat where the soils are poisoned, where the water is poisoned, and you plant pollinator attractive plants, the question that's been raised is, are you really improving the situation or are you simply creating additional killing fields? And I don't think that many of these people have looked beneath the surface and, and looked at what that habitat really has to offer. Well, I think this past growing season was a prime example for what exactly can happen if the bigger picture is not addressed, which is the impact of these chemicals and the sublethal effects. For example, in my own habitat, I saw this past growing season only one monarch butterfly, and I've got milkweed in a number of places on the property, not to mention the fact that I only saw one question mark butterfly and maybe a handful of swallowtails, but that's pretty much about it. The thing is, is that I've been maintaining butterfly habitats for many, many years, and to see only one monarch for the entire season is horrible. But unfortunately, this is the reality. So when you're looking at habitat, when I communicated to one of the listeners that wrote in, it's kind of like if you were to live in a sewer, would you be able to live a healthy life? Yeah, you could live if you lived in the sewer, but would you be able to live a healthy life? Well, I, Most likely not. I think part of the problem we face is that unlike the older chemicals where the effect was immediate and dramatic, the organophosphates and the carbamates, with the systemic pesticides, the effect can be much more subtle. And let's just go back to what we were talking about a little earlier. Here along the front range, we've had a, what appears to be a productive season. Most of the beekeepers have had a good honey crop, or at least a reasonable honey crop. And, and it looks like everything is going along fine. But if the bees have been exposed to these systemic pesticides, even in minute amounts, that may not express itself until the middle of winter, the following spring, sometime in the summer. And, and I've used the example of tobacco. A single cigarette didn't kill people. And that's, that's some of what we're seeing with the systemic pesticides. The effect is there. It just takes a little more time for it to express itself. And... Uh, we learn as we go, and what we're learning is that we are living in an environment that's been so heavily poisoned that it's very difficult to maintain healthy colonies of bees. Thanks, Tom. Also in the news, there was an article that was published by Inhabitat.com, and it's in regards to probiotics. And the article is called New probiotics could protect honeybees against neonicotinoid pesticides. The article was written by Greg Beach. Now, Tom, from what I understand, you know some commercial beekeepers that are actually exploring this option. What are your thoughts on this? Very interesting. Um, this is somewhat new to me. I've, I've read the article, and I have talked with one commercial beekeeper who has tried this, he hasn't been using it for too long, but he thinks he's beginning to see a positive response on the part of the bees. That's early evidence, and I'm not sure what it really means, but at least the early indications are that there may be some benefit from these probiotics. But again, I think you have to look at this in the big picture. and. To take a colony of bees that's struggling in the face of these environmental challenges and to put it on steroids, probiotics, you may mask the problem for a while, but you really haven't changed anything. And I've said more than once in the past that beekeepers can carry out their responsibilities, that they can create ostensibly healthy colonies of bees. But in most parts of the United States, what we're doing is we're sending them out into an environment where they cannot survive. So we may be able to, in the abstract, improve the health of an individual colony of bees, but it's going to go in, out into a hostile environment where it will not survive. Our next topic 
regards Owen Patterson, and he was interviewed on the BBC. This can be found in a segment in which Owen Patterson solves world hunger on BBC. Quote, South African GM maize yields 500 to 1,000 percent more than conventional seeds. I know that Graham White, who is a very outspoken bee health advocate from Scotland, has had quite a lot to say about Owen Patterson. And Tom, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, most of what I've learned, I've learned from my friend Graham, but I've also kept track of what Mr. Patterson has been saying. And and he's, like a lot of uh, corporate apologists, Owen Patterson seems to be either intentionally or unintentionally ignorant of the facts of the situation and is a master at distorting the statistics. It's it's possible that there has been a significant increase in subsistence farming when you add genetically modified crops, but you have to understand that they're not just adding genetically modified crops. They're giving these people help from agronomists. They're giving them irrigation water. They're giving them many things that they didn't have previously. But it sounds it sounds very dramatic when you say that there's been a 5, 000, 500 to 1,000 percent increase in the crop. It's questionable whether that's the case, and even if it is the case, it's not simply because of genetically modified crops. What's being lost here? are naturally evolved varieties of, of hundreds of different plants, crops, that have been cultivated over thousands of years. And when you introduce genetically modified crops, you've, you've obliterated that history and you've narrowed the, the number of crops that we have. And all we have to have is one parasite, one virus that attacks that, that limited family of crops, the genetically modified crops, and we have a food disaster. Not to mention the fact that the neonicotinoids are the companion technology to GMOs. So what that basically means is every time a GMO seed is planted, it's treated with the neonicotinoid pesticides. And this is why the GMOs are such a huge problem for our pollinators. Well, it, it appears that what has happened as a result of these two technologies, genetic engineering and systemic pesticides, is that the environment has been poisoned at a level that's almost beyond comprehension. And just recently, the USGS, the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, revealed the statistics that they have been gathering over the past four years, and they found that the neonicotinoids were present in over 60% of the samples that they took. And the implication of that is enormous, because while we focus on the pollinators, and the pollinators need pollen, obviously, and nectar, those are their primary food sources, there are many other life forms at the lower end of the food chain that don't depend upon those flowering plants in that fashion. But everything requires water. All life requires water. And it appears that these systemic pesticides have contaminated the water sources at, at an enormous level. Which actually leads into the next topic, which is an article that appeared in dailymail.co.uk. And the article is titled, One in Three Born This Year Could Be Hit by Dementia. Experts warn of looming national health crisis. And some of the notes the article highlights. It says, some 27% of boys born in 2015 will develop life-shattering brain disease when they hit 60+. plus. Report by Alzheimer's research has shown girls face even bleaker future, largely due to their longer life expectancy. And then it says 37% are destined to suffer unless better treatments are developed. Now, there has been a lot of feedback from our listeners that they feel that it's because 
of the technology that's being used to grow the crops, all the chemicals and whatnot that are, as you just mentioned, Tom, polluting the environment. It's very concerning. I'm old enough that I have grandchildren, and I'm very concerned about their welfare. <clears throat> what at the these billions of dollars in profits that have accrued from these systemic pesticides are only profitable because the industries have been able to do what industries do so well, which is to externalize the costs. And, and in part, those costs are represented by the environmental damage that we've incurred, which may very well uh, be far in excess of the billions and billions of dollars in profits that they're reaping. Were they required to ac account for the damage that they've done, these technologies would not likely be profitable at all. No, unfortunately, they would not. But, you know, at the end of the day, with more and more people having diseases like dementia, Alzheimer's, what have you, it makes you wonder, yeah, the lifespan might be longer, but what is the quality of life after a certain point because of the environmental exposure? And that is a very big concern, especially with a lot of young mothers. So, you know, it remains to be seen, Tom. And, and many of these problems don't occur only later in life. Many of them are experienced by children from an er a very early age, and their the quality of their lives are compromised because of their exposure to these technologies. The interesting thing is with the neonicotinoids, the systemics, is we're seeing one study after another that shows that there is no yield benefit from the use of these systemic pesticides. And this is one of the major things that the chemical companies have used to sell it to the farmers. The farmers have been given the hustle by 10 men. They are paying a premium price for seeds from an industry, a seed industry that's been monopolized by these large corporations, and they're seeing little or no benefit from that. They've been given the, the hustle. As I said, it remains to be seen whether or not action is going to take place. I mean, if you look at something as basic as a stop sign or even a stoplight, it takes so much effort to just get a new um, a, a new sign put in. And it's usually after somebody's died, that's when the community takes action. So if you look at things on a larger scale, how many people are going to suffer from the effects of these systemic pesticides before necessary action takes place? And I guess that is the burning question. Well, we seem to be prepared to endure greater and greater consequences from these things and there's been very little change in in the way they they're doing business and and in fact one of the consequences of these technologies is they rapidly create resistant pests resistant weeds and the chemistry has to be added to in order to control these resistant varieties so it's a chemical treadmill that appears to have no end Unfortunately, I have to agree with you, Tom. It does appear to have no end, but you know, more and more people are talking about it, and I think that's the main thing. The public is much more aware, and I think that's a healthy sign. I couldn't agree more. Tom, thank you so much for joining me today. As always, it's, it's great to be able to talk about these topics. And also, folks, please keep writing into the show. Send your questions to questions at theorganicview.com, or you can reach out to me on social media, or you can connect directly with Tom, at Tom uh, on his website at um, boulderbeekeepers.com forward slash Tom's Corner. And June, thank you for giving everyone the opportunity to talk about these very important questions. Thank you, Tom. And folks, tune in next week as Tom and I continue our discussion exploring the impact of neonicotinoids. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon, everyone.